I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. My name is Brian Anderson. I'm the editor of City Journal Magazine. And I want to welcome all of you here today on behalf of uh, the Manhattan Institute and our co-sponsors for this uh, important discussion, uh, the Milken Institute. We've got a great turnout, I'm very pleased by that, and an extremely accomplished group of people on hand to talk about Skid Row. Now last autumn, City Journal published a cover story by Heather McDonald called The Reclamation of Skid Row. In this uh, in the story, Ms. McDonald traces the history of the area's 50 blocks, which for decades have been notorious for homelessness, open-air drug use, prostitution, and a wide range of criminal activity. In a, in a very thickly reported narrative, she describes the LAPD's efforts to turn the neighborhood around in the Safer Cities initiative. The Safer Cities, she argues forcefully, is succeeding by applying the broken windows theory of policing, which holds that if one fails to maintain low-level public order, leaving broken windows unrepaired, for instance, then one encourages more serious violations of the civic fabric until, as things get worse and worse, it unravels entirely. That theory, applied by police, has dramatically revitalized cities, most famously New York during the 1990s. Now, Heather McDonald's article sparked an enormous amount of interest, to say the least. Uh, the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times ran lengthy adaptations of it, as did several other papers and she appeared on TV and radio to discuss it. The piece uh, sizzled on the internet, to say the least, generating a, 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 just a storm of correspondence, uh, with some supporting her analysis and others contending that the Safer Cities Initiative was in fact a, a kind of crackdown on the rights of the poor. The interest was sufficient, and the topic important enough, for the Manhattan Institute to, uh, to come out here to LA to explore the transformation of Skid Row. We've extended, uh, extended invitations to a host of people passionate about what is happening now with a wide range of viewpoints in the hopes of a fruitful uh, discussion today. And the result is, is indeed today's event, which I think you'll find uh, quite informative. Uh, you'll see in your packets the agenda for the day, uh, which we'll try to move, move along pretty briskly, uh, though there'll be time for some questions uh, after each panel is concluded. Now, it gives me uh, an extraordinary amount of pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, who will provide some opening remarks and uh, set the stage for today's uh, panel. Now, James Q. Wilson's achievement, like his range of interests, is absolutely astonishing. It's uh, worthy of modern-day Max Weber. He's written or co-written 15 books so far on topics as diverse as the socio-biological foundations of morality, marriage as a social institution, functioning of bureaucracy, policing, and the relationship with crime to human nature. He's published widely in, in leading magazines, including Commentary, City Journal, The New Republic, many, many others, as well as countless academic journals. He is currently the Ronald Reagan Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine, and he has held previous faculty appointments at Harvard University and UCLA. Now, people call Professor Wilson the Dean of Contemporary Political Science for a reason. He has served on a number of national commissions concerned with public policy, and he's currently the chairman of the Council of Academic Advisors of the American Enterprise Institute. He's been elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the American Philosophical Society. He's the recipient of the James Madison Award for a Career of Distinguished Scholarship, uh, presented by the American Political Science Association. And he's received honorary degrees from six universities, including Harvard. In 2003, he was presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award, and in 2007, he received the Bradley Cross. Relevant to today, today's conference, one of Professor Wilson's abiding areas of concern has been public order. Together with one of our panelists today, the renowned social thinker George Kelly, he authored the famous 1982 Atlantic Monthly article on fixing broken windows, which became the springboard of the policing revolution of the past two decades helping to revitalize American cities, as I have mentioned. 
But to speak more on how policing can influence public order and help struggling neighborhoods uh, come back and flourish again, uh, I give you uh, Professor James T. Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, when I was a young boy growing up in Long Beach, California, I used to take the train red line from Long Beach up to the station in what is now Skid Row, Los Angeles, in part because I wanted to do research to turn papers at the Los Angeles County Library, and in part because I wanted to go to bookstores where I could keep the magazines and keep the pictures of half those women. The normal activities of a 16-year-old boy. Walking those streets in those days, uh, I was struck by the fact that there were homeless people around, but not in large numbers. Some were there because they preferred to live their own life in the streets. Some were there uh, because of mental difficulties. Some were there, many were there because of alcohol abuse. But the drug epidemic had not hit this country, and certainly not Los Angeles, the problem was manageable. Four years ago, I went to visit the Salvation Army mission in Skid Row. I spent a day with them in the mission and walking the streets. And I was struck by how massive the problem of the homeless had become. You could not walk down the streets without stepping over people and saluting them. We watched open air drug sales. Uh, and the missions there, run by the Salvation Army and several other organizations, were struggling mightily to cope with this problem. I thought to myself four years ago, what would a patrol officer do if faced with this problem? Walking these streets, he might make a dress for drinking in public, sleeping in public, walking the sidewalk. But if he made that arrest or issued that citation, if you look down the block, you see 30 or 40 other people doing exactly the same thing. And reasonably would conclude to himself or herself, what I do here can make no difference. Moreover, arresting a homeless person is a message problem. Uh, they don't smell well, and their trash should be handled well dressed. As an Therefore, it's not surprising that the police, not only in Los Angeles, but the police in most large cities, increasingly focus their efforts on dealing with major problems, answering 911 calls, driving around in squad cars, uh, and attempting to deal with serious crimes where a big arrest might make a big difference, whereas an arrest or a citation of homeless on the streets could make no difference at all. Last Monday, I visited this same area again and walked around these area these streets with some patrol officers from the Central Bureau. It was striking that the temperatures had been. There was a dramatic reduction in the number of people. They were not absent, but they were there, but nothing like what I saw four years ago. There were no tents. Crime rate statistics for this area suggest that crime rates have dropped dramatically. What changed? Well, many things changed. Of not changing and remain on the agenda for change. But 50 or more patrol officers were assigned to this area to walk the streets and to enforce the key rules. No public drinking, no sleeping on the streets, no walking sidewalks, no aggressive begging. And they did so in cooperation with the many missions located so that if somebody was to be dealt with, they would be first in effort to find a place where they could sleep. There was no problem in finding a place where they could eat people because they were always open for food. Uh, the bed supply was sometimes adequate and sometimes inadequate. Uh, supplementing their efforts were the, was the work of the uh, young uh, safety officers dressed in red t shirts and paid for by the business improvement district, which have extended the reach, the sound, the sight, the smell of the police department to help them understand what is happening uh, and help them manage it. Now this experience that four years ago to last Monday repeats an experience that George Kellen and I and others have seen in New York City and the other places. Uh, when uh, Chief Bill Bratton directed the Transit City Police in New York City, he discovered a system in which the subway cars were coming to graffiti which turnstile jumpers were easily evading paying the $1.15 fare necessary uh, to uh, enter the subway system. And these problems presented exactly the same problems as the homeless in Skid Row. 
why arrest one turnstile jumper? It would make little sense. Uh, he would tie you up for several hours completing that one arrest. Uh, and what would happen? Nothing. Somebody might get a night in jail at most. Uh, ending graffiti? Well, graffiti is offensive to some, uh, pleasing to others. What difference does it make if the graffiti are on the farm? Besides, how do you end it? Chief Bratton then, uh, working with other people, decided that the graffiti had to go and these turnstile members had to be arrested. When he arrested the turnstile members, he discovered something very interesting. Many of them were wanted on warrants for offenses far more serious than the day of the summer of the New York City. Just as people who had been arrested in the libraries of Los Angeles, in many cases on warrants indicated they had committed far more serious offenses in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, the result of the transit city experience was that suddenly the key to cars and orderly management of entrance, the full payment of the dollar and fifteen cent fare, which is what charged, made the transit authority more attractive to the person. And the use of the transit system went up and the crime rates in the transit system went down. To manage the problem of arresting one person and spending two hours booking that person. They would hold a group of arrestees in the subway system uh, behind some strength and then move them out in groups and buses so that all could be booked simultaneously. The major lesson of the transit authority police, and I think the major lesson of the experience in Skid Row, is that public order is valuable. It is valuable to the citizens of New York and Los Angeles and the United States City simply because people feel more comfortable living in a community where when they go out on the streets, they feel that the decent people are in charge, that there is not that there is not aggressive uh, solicitation of violence, that people do not sleep on the streets, that people do not drink in that disorderly manner. And because they make the streets safer, that is to say more community, the people I think respond permanently. The other reason is that if you increase public order, George Powell and I suggested this may well drive down the crime rate. Now, whether or not this is true has not been adequately tested. Uh, but the one major test of it, done by Michael Chicago and his colleagues in the Jersey City, uh, selected a group of persons and tried various elements of what George and I call the broken control strategy. They call it maintenance of public order, to see if the reduction, the improvement in order in those experiment experiments tried would bring down the crime rate compared to those persons who were not uh, They concluded, not using the phrase broken windows and not even talking about the argument on the crime rate, that it did. That is to say that any of public order brought down the crime rate. Whether this is true in other places, remains to be seen. Uh, most cities do not change their police strategy on the basis of an experimental doctrine. Uh, they are far too busy taking the reality of the problems around them. Uh, then they are too busy applying all their efforts to test theories of the public existing or possibly crack on civil society. It's unfortunate because we cannot then say with confidence that the public order strategy, when applied to everyone, so we will result in all, or most cases, a reduction in crime. But the key situation about which I have noticed a change, that is to say, the transit police and the later quality of life strategy in New York City and the changes that have occurred in Skidrow and Los Angeles support the view that there is a relationship between improving public order and the reduction in crime. The reduction in crime in Los Angeles was not the result of being harsh. I spent some time with a couple of officers who, though they could easily take the exam for sergeant or either in yours and law and form charges, I prefer to be seen to read officers and remain on the street for the action days. Generally, what they do is simply stand there and talk to them. They talk to them in my opinion, in understand way, uh, making it clear what the rules are, making it clear that they must follow the rules, fortunately, things might happen giving them time to sort out their lives. Uh, the drug 
industry is still well towards that. It was largely dominated by people from other parts of the city, and was in one place and was in another place, not selling drugs. Uh, it was an attractive place for the bloods and the to work together because, as I understand it, there was a kind of mutual non-aggression. You could sell drugs, get well, without having to fight for the wrong plan. Something that was not possible in other parts of the West Indies. Uh, when you end the drug trend by use of undercover narcotics factors, and by having police officers put you up in the outside the control of the city, standing around and watching Reduce those crimes that are associated with drug use, and of course, you reduce enormously the cost that it puts people who are uh, subject to drug abuse. Now, much more needs to be done. One of the problems in Los Angeles is not the same as the problem in New York and Chicago, and that is that you know, the great conditions that have contributed so importantly to serving homeless are all concentrated in one spot. Many of them are new and impressive buildings. And this means that no matter what we do in the Skid Row area of Los Angeles, we will remain in hiding. Because if we need to live off the food and bed supply conditions, there are a few other places in Los Angeles too. No. This is not the case in the other cities, but the conditions such that one can for the long run, it refers to reduce the concentration of homeless people. But reducing the concentration of homeless people, you will never eliminate homeless people. Some people live in the street, but you should live outside the normal bounds of ordinary human society. But we can urge them to do the doors and to supply them with food. You will never get all of them off the street. You will never get enough off the street to be in place to the street. Doing everything that is necessary goes well beyond what the simple police department. But in my experience, at least from my students, has learned and what effectively other agencies can see as collaborative measures. In doing so, they are learning a lesson, we learn a lesson, that is an old story of a century or so ago. When Roger Lane wrote his book, Police in the City, about Boston, his analysis by saying the main task of the police is not to elect the police, but to make them the work. He called the police in Boston to be watching the police, who were in charge of assuring people that normal rules of public security were observed. He just meant that they could be off the streets, not finding shelter, allowing some of them, in fact, to spend the night in the police station in Boston. This is a lesson that was lost in the loss of the United States in general uh, over time. As crime became more serious, as the population of big cities increased, the threat to the control of humanity, as police moved into squad cars, as police were equipped with two day radios, as the 911 cell number was designed, used by citizens everywhere. Natural function of the police is to try to control what their own task is. So the facility is looking for me before it is legal. It is now being revitalized in Los Angeles. It is being revitalized in New York, Boston, and New York City. I am delighted to be here to open up this conference. I look forward to the remarks that I will make. I know there are a lot of the Safety Cities Initiative is around a uh, general argument about the preservation of public order. It's a conversation we should have because I think if we have the conversation seriously and thoughtfully, we will discover that we can agree on a strategy that will put us together. Thank you.
would, I would invite the next panelist to join me. Good morning. We have a nice crowd here today. My name is Brian Kennedy. I'm president of the Claremont Institute. It is a think tank here in Southern California dedicated to the recovery of America's first principles and their application to our current uh, political problems. Thank you to Brian Anderson in the Manhattan Institute and the Milken Institute for their leadership in uh, bringing together the best public policy descriptions to America's cities and for sponsoring this important discussion today of the most important issue. My relationship to this panel, I should say from the outset, is both personal and professional. On the personal side, I am the son of a Los Angeles policeman, Robert Kennedy, who after serving at the Marine in the South Pacific, returned to his home of Los Angeles and as a patrolman walked the beat on what is today Skid Row. You didn't even know that, did you? Uh, he did that for six months and then began to drive a squad car in this area for the next three years between 1946 and 1949. He would then go on to narcotics and then robbery homicide. Uh, he would meet my mother, who was also uh, working for the Los Angeles Police Department, and would marry her and eventually have yours truly. Uh, of even more significance, my grandfather, Arthur Kennedy, was the first welfare commissioner in the city of Los Angeles in 1926. This was when the welfare commission was concerned with the social welfare of the Los Angeles community. On the professional level, my interest is simple. The first purpose of government is to provide for the common defense and to ensure domestic tranquility. The state of our cities and our inner cities is central to this in the purpose of our discussion here this morning. The title of this panel is Saving Skid Row from Squalor or Criminalizing Homelessness. We have an excellent assembly of speakers. Let me introduce them individually. They will speak for seven minutes each or so. Then we will then have an exchange between them and then have time uh, to open it up to the audience for discussion. First up, we have Heather McDonald. Heather is the contributing editor to City Journal. She is a John M. Owen Fellow at the Manhattan, Manhattan Institute, and she is also a recipient of the Bradley Prize for Outstanding Intellectual Achievement. Anyone who reads City Journal, who reads our papers, knows that Heather McDonald's journalism is among the most serious in the country, I think, her contribution to the life of the city and uh, the future of the country is the most important. And I think all of us in Los Angeles are very fortunate to have her with us today. Heather McDonald. Thank you so much for that delightful introduction, Brian. I, I, um, I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I'm honored to be here today. Um, Mr. Wilson, took up the problem of order maintenance from the police perspective of the seeming futility of it. I want to briefly uh, address the other side of, of uh, challenge to Safer City Initiative, which is the claim that it is criminalizing homelessness. Uh, and, and Mr. Wilson also gave a, a brief sketch of what Skid Row was like. I'm going to reinforce that because I think many Los Angelinos have never been to Skid Row. And, and so they really, you, you, if you hadn't been down here uh, until about a year ago, you, you simply couldn't imagine uh, what, what this place looked like. And I, I want to argue that the Los Angeles Police Department's Safer City Initiative is the best thing that has happened to Skid Row in decades. Before it began in September 2006, Skid Row was one of the most violent areas of Los Angeles. The rate of rapes, murders, robberies, and assaults was nearly five times as high as in the gang-plagued Rampart Division, despite a population density less than a quarter of Rampart. In a typical assault in May 2006, a homeless parolee stomped another homeless woman to death on the sidewalk. That night, there were 82 available shelter beds on Skid Row, and an outreach team had managed to persuade only two people to come inside. 
Now the roots uh, of this violence lay in a culture of anarchy that had no equal across the country. Sidewalks were impassable, covered with tents, bodies, and human waste. Prostitution and drug trafficking were open and shameless. The people most hurt by this squalor were the elderly residents of the area's SROs, the mentally ill, and addicts trying to get clean in the missions who were held hostage in their tiny apartments by the violence of the streets. The street chaos was not some naturally occurring phenomenon, but rather the result of decades of litigation to block every reasonable law enforcement effort in the area. Even public health efforts drew the ire of the advocates. When the Central City East Association tried to clean infectious bacteria and feces from the sidewalks, the advocates showed up en masse to protest. Even though the association had assured the homeless that they could return to their spot on the sidewalk after the cleaning operation was over, the advocates lay down under the cleaning truck as if it was contained Bull Connor's hoses. The forces of lawlessness, however, have finally met their match in the compassionate and lawful policing of the Safer City Initiative. As I'm sure Commander Smith will, will explain, uh, major felonies dropped 42% in the first six months of the initiative. Now the vast majority of skid row arrests target assaults and drug trafficking. But it is also used misdemeanor and quality of life enforcement to restore safety to the neighborhood. And that's what's been so controversial. But the initiative need not apologize for doing so. The idea that someone living on the streets has a right to break so-called minor laws has led to nothing but death, disease, and despair. Far from criminalizing homelessness, as the advocates claim, the Safer City Initiative provides a route into services. Everyone arrested for a misdemeanor who has no background of violence or an outstanding warrant is eligible for a brief drug and housing program instead of jail. Amazingly, nearly a quarter of eligible arrestees turn down this offer the sooner to be back on the streets after a, a short jail stay. Vagrants also can wipe past offenses and fines off their record if they complete three months of rehab, a, a valid uh, social goal in and of itself. Enforcing jaywalking and littering laws has made it harder for dealers to hang out on the corners peddling their wares. And asking someone to pour out his bottle at 3 p.m., as I've seen the officers do repeatedly, stops a knife fight at 10 p.m. As for the charge that we've heard uh, by many of the advocates fighting this, this program, that the police are abusing the homeless, it is sheer calumny that anyone in this room can test for himself by accompanying the police on their rounds. The facts are these. The police are the most constant and humane source of help in the area, and the homeless know it. A love fest greets Commander Smith and his senior lead officers whenever they travel the district. The police put themselves and their families at risk of disease every day, trying to cajole the homeless to come off the streets. They have a rapport with vagrants that armies of elite anti-cop litigators can only dream of. A six-year resident of the Gladys Street sidewalk has testified, quote, the LAPD contacts me several times a day. They are my friends and they are good to me." End quote. The Safer City Initiative is not about poverty, but about unlawful behavior. It has saved more lives in a year than 30 years of civil libertarian lawsuits ever achieved. Skid Row's transformation is the greatest vindication to date of the power of policing to improve lives. Thank you very much. Smart and efficient. I didn't even have to tell you uh, your time was up.
Uh, our next speaker is Commander Andrew Smith. Commander Smith joined the Los Angeles Police Department in 1988. He has worked in a variety of areas. He is responsible for the uh, central area of Los Angeles. He has a most difficult job, and uh, we thank him very much for joining us today and uh, sharing with us his experience as Commander Andrew Smith. She says they won't bite, so if you, anybody back there wants to sit down, they're welcome to join us up here. Yeah. More empty shelter areas. Obviously, computer work's not my forte. Good morning, everyone. Andrew Smith, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this panel. It's really an honor to be here with some of these distinguished uh, visitors that we have and some good friends. And as I look around the audience, it's nice to see uh, so many familiar faces from the neighborhood, uh, Don Garza, among all the others that are here. It's really uh, nice to have you folks here. Thank you for coming out. Um, Safer Cities Initiative, obviously I'm a huge fan of the Safer Cities Initiative, and it's not just the cops, and it's not just the cops out there trying to arrest our way out of homelessness. We recognize when we first started that, you know, rounding up the 2,000 or so people that were sleeping on the streets of Skid Row and putting them all in jail for vagrancy wasn't going to work. So obviously we needed a partnership with a bunch more people just besides the police department, and if you'll indulge me for just a second, I want to thank a couple people because I'll forget if I don't. City Attorney Rocky Delgadillo, Rocky Delgadillo and his uh, dream team of attorneys that helped us throughout this whole thing and are still there. Songhai Magud Armstead, who's in the back from the City Attorney's Office. Um, Jose Garbidi, who was here as our friend and, and helped us throughout the entire process. Uh, Carolyn Phillips, Jeff Isaacs, folks in the Mayor's Office, um, Gil Cedillo's folks. There's so many people. Our partner Andy Bales from the, uh, the Union Rescue Mission. So many people did so much to help Skid Row and help us with this transformation of Skid Row. First of all, though, I think, uh, if you could pull that next slide up there, there's the man, Dr. George Kelling. He's the one who was uh, Chief Bratton's um, mentor, I guess, Chief Bratton's uh, confidant, Chief Bratton's uh, kind of philosophic guide through this whole thing. Um, and Chief Bratton was described in, uh, by Joe Dominic in next month's Playboy magazine, and I did read the article, not just the pictures. <laughs> He was described, Chief Bratton, as not only the country's most famous police chief, but also the most influential crime fighter in recent history. And that's a description of Chief Bratton by Joe Dominic. I've always described him as kind of like the father of modern policing. And if you think of him as the father of modern policing, I think of Dr. Kelly and Dr. Wilson as maybe the godfather of modern policing. Because the way that they formulated this uh, broken windows concept is really kind of the way our department has changed over the past years, and we really, moved in that, we really are moving in that direction. You kind of know how we got here, you kind of know how we got to Skid Row. Let me just take a minute to paint a picture of the chaos that is, and, or, or that one time was Skid Row. You go to the next slide. This is an encampment on Industrial Street, and that is typical of what we saw for decades on the Skid Row area. Um, as a young policeman from Iron Mountain, Michigan, when I first came down and took a look at Skid Row, I said, holy smokes, what are we doing here? Look at this, look at how people are living uh, just a couple blocks away from City Hall in downtown Los Angeles. And the kind of human behavior that we saw in those encampments was just, it was mind-boggling. The sexual assaults that you see, 3,800 parolees that lived in the area were preying on the people that were out there. The mentally ill were sometimes so disturbed that they couldn't even report that they'd been the victims of a crime. Elderly women, senior citizen women sexually assaulted in those tents, come to Andy Bales at the mission with broken ribs. Uh, just horrible, horrible situation. And in some place that people really, uh, is improper or Im impossible to believe. I'll give you two little quick stories, and, and, I, and I apologize for ruining your appetite, but these are two things that came, two stories, anecdotes that tell you about the kind of 
inhuman and unhuman behavior that we'd see on Skid Row. Um, one was told by my uh, classmate the other day, he said he was working on Skid Row as a police officer um, in the 90s, and a uh, new campfire like this happened all the time. Every night there were 20 or 30 of them around. At this particular one, one of the folks at the campfire had captured and killed one of the neighborhood dogs, had skinned it, put it on a spit, and was preparing to eat it when my partner came along, my partner came along and saw it. Um, this, while well, at Andy Bale's mission, you can eat three times, a, three times a day for free. It's just that if you allow folks to live in encampments such as that, they'll engage in, in behavior that is not human. Um, another time, I personally was driving just south of Skid Row, and I came across a guy with a shopping cart. In that shopping cart was a severed horse's head, which I investigation showed that he had taken from a rendering plant, which is just south of Skid Row, over uh, outside of the city limits. Parenthetically, I used to work there in an off-duty job, uh, making sure that homeless folks didn't jump over the fence and go into the pit. For those who don't know what a rendering plant is, it's where they throw the carcasses of dead circus animals and zoo animals and the meat that gets expired at bonds and routes and whatnot gets thrown in there. Homeless folks would jump into there, grab the green hams, cut off the bad part, and turn around and sell it or turn around and eat it. This particular individual had a horse's head that he covered from one of those bins and was pushing on a shopping cart. I said, what are you doing? Because I'm taking this home, or I'm taking this to my camp under the 6th Street Bridge. I said, what are you going to do with it? He said, I'm going to eat it. So here, that's the kind of behavior that we saw. Not only behavior about humans on each other, but just behavior that's just not what we'd expect out of a 21st century city of Los Angeles. I'll throw you a couple quick views of some of these encampments, because I'll talk all day if you let me, and I only have seven minutes. I'm down about six, right? Uh, real quickly, the uh, the Encampments that you'd see, obviously a guy with a wheelchair can't get through there. Again, more encampments, just all, all throughout the whole downtown uh, Skid Row area we saw encampments such as this. The best of intentions, uh, the city or the folks put out about uh, 25 outhouses. Um, those were featured in the LA Times, you remember some of the articles by Steve Lopez that talked about how they became houses of prostitution how they became shooting galleries, how gang members would take over and charge people a dollar to shoot up or, or two dollars to go in there and have sex with a prostitute on, on Skid Row. Unbelievable, but I personally saw three guys coming out of an outhouse with one woman at the same time. I can't even imagine what was going on in there. But this is what would typically happen. The outhouses would be occupied by someone who took it over as a residence, and the people would use the side of the outhouse as a restroom. So we ended up getting rid of those as part of our, uh, part of our food plan. These photos, and I'll just flip through the first, next three or so, those are photos of uh, open air drug use taken by one of the businesses over there. A guy, I believe he owns a shrimp company. He would just take pictures out of his window of folks smoking crack and shooting up heroin. We got one videotape footage of some uh, five people shooting up heroin using the same needle. You know, in this day and age, the same needle, fill up with heroin, shoot it up, fill up the next guy, shoot him up, right around a little circle of, of heroin. It was just absolutely horrific. Again, open air drug dealing, broad daylight, uh, just across the street from one of the uh, uh, fish processors now. Uh, this is Industrial Street, as you, as you can imagine. You can see, obviously, the sidewalk is completely covered by these encampments. Um, home of murders, home of people hiding from the law, a great place if you're a fugitive from justice. Nobody has ID. You can say whoever you are and pretend to be someone else. And we catch murderers from Texas, and we catch uh, uh, sexual assault suspects from all over the country that come down here to hide amongst the Skid Row population. Click on the news. Yes. Oh, by the way, all these in camp, all these photos and stuff, it's going to be on our website. So if, you, if I go too fast or you need to see the rest of it, it'll be on our website. Remember this picture. This is one I showed you a little earlier from Industrial Street after the Safer Cities Initiative was gone for about six months. The next one I'll show you. This is what it looked like uh, six months afterwards. The encampments were gone. A lot of the folks had moved on to other things. Uh, next slide. There's three prongs to safer cities. Again, it's not just about enforcement. There's two other prongs to it. You know, the enforcement is obviously um, next slide. The enforcement, obviously, what we wanted to do was remove the criminal element. Those criminal predators, those drug dealers, those people who were there to prey on the homeless, the, uh, the gang members that uh, were blood gang members up on Main Street that were selling dope and and uh, making their living on the on the addiction, unfortunately, of some of the folks that live down there. Uh, we wanted to remove them so we could deal with the population that we had. The next step was the outreach. Go out with the folks like Andy Bales, the folks from our SOS program, and try and get these folks out of these tents and out of these encampments and into some type of program or into some type of better life. 
folks from SRO Laws who were, were tremendous, and Anika Nelson's here, helped us out with uh, uh, providing shelter, providing beds, and providing housing for folks. The last part of it was enhancement. We needed to work with the mayor's office, the city council, Huizar, Jan Perry's office, to get the darkened streets lighted again. What would happen is, A, the gang members would shoot out the street lights, B, the, the um, transients or the homeless folks that didn't have any money would pull the wiring out to go sell the copper for scrap. So there were hundreds of lights that weren't working. Well, if you add 2,000 people to downtown Skid Row area and you know, hundreds of lights aren't working, at nighttime, it's just a food problem. It is a, it, they called it Mardi Gras crack, but it was just a, it was a dark, dangerous, scary place for anybody to be. A couple slides. I won't bore you with the, the type of felonies and narcotics arrests that we made. Next slide, please. Next slide. Violent crime obviously plummeted. We can talk about that all day if you want, because I love talking about crime. But uh, violent crime, 2005, 2006, 2007. Um, that's for all of Central, but the bulk of our violent crime was in the Skid Row area. Same with the property crime, obviously. This is our tent count and count of people sleeping on the streets. We did that uh, periodically uh, every two weeks for a while there. You can see the very first one was when we first started our Safer Cities Initiative on the, 8th, on the 16th. Actually, 18th of September 2006, 1,876 people were sleeping on the street that night. Um, as of the 4th of this month, we're down to about 720. We think we reached a population, kind of a steady state right there, where there's some really hardcore folks that don't want to get in, um, even if it's cold, even if it's wet. We're right around 700. We've been there for a number of months. The last slide is uh, thanks to our folks, our friends at Cartifax. And uh, this will probably maybe be the last uh, story I tell you. Chief Braden came up to me and when I showed him that we had all these homeless statistics of how many people there, he goes, it would be really neat to see if we could track where folks are living and where they're moving from as we work on our safer cities. Can you find some way to map that? And I thought, sure, Chief, I can. No idea how to, no idea how I was going to do that. And then Eric Richardson from Cartifax comes up to me and he, and un, unsolicited, tapped me on the shoulder at a public meeting once. He goes, yeah, I, I work for Cartifax. We're a mapping company. Uh, is there any pro bono work we can do for the police department? I thought, holy smokes, how does this happen? Anyway, thank you, Eric. You can see the red is where the heavy concentration was. It goes into the yellow where the lighter concentration is. And, and we kind of track where homeless folks have moved. Um, you can see the first one was on uh, November of 2006. The next one was uh, last summer. Um, and you can see that the heavy concentrations under the Sixth Street Bridge in the middle part of Skid Row are gone. Um, you know, we can all debate where those folks have gone. A lot of them went to jail, I guarantee you, if they were down there uh, committing felonies. A lot of them got into rehab. A lot of them maybe had something better to do because a lot of folks in Skid Row um, had something better to do than hang up there. Um, Captain Wakefield was my partner throughout the two and a half years or so that I was on there. And we worked hand in hand and with uh, the folks from uh, Central City East, get, uh, Estelle Lopez and her crew to do what we could to change this. Um, been a policeman for about 20 years. Jody's got about 23. We, we both agree that the most satisfying thing that we've done in our police career was to be a part of the transformation of Skid Row and the part of the transformation of this horrible, horrible place into something where people can not go to suffer and die, as we saw so much, but go to maybe find recovery, maybe get their life started over again, get rock bottom, and maybe start to come back up. The only other thing I can compare it to is the satisfaction that we got looking at these 50 young police officers that we pulled from all over the city, brand new cops, that went out there and did some of the most difficult work under the most difficult circumstances with some of the most difficult population um, and had been doing it for about a year and a half now. And to see those young officers mature and transform into um, hardworking, dedicated, compassionate, caring officers was probably even more satisfying than watching the, the neighborhood change. And I know those officers are going to carry those traits throughout the rest of their police careers. And I think any one of those cops is going to be a tremendous asset to the, the men and women that live in this uh, city of Los Angeles. So I think that's just about seven minutes. I'm ready to move on. Thanks. When you're carrying a gun, seven minutes, seven minutes. Carrying a gun. Our next speaker is Professor Mark Kleiman. He is Professor of Public Policy in the US UCLA School of Public Affairs. He teaches courses on methods of policy analysis and on drug abuse and crime control policy. He is the author of many books, including Marijuana, Costs of Abuse, Costs of Control, and When Brute Force Fails, Strategies for Crime Control. 
We're most grateful that you could join us this morning, Professor Clement. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, and, and thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, I, I'm here by default. Uh, the Manhattan Institute was looking for a critic of the program, and for some reason, uh, no one wanted to enter the lion's den. Um, so my old friend Howard Husak called me and asked me if I'd play. And I said, you know, if you're counting on me to hold down the left wing, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, uh, George Kelly and I have been associated for a long time. I should state my conflict of interest. I've done a little, little subcontracting with him. Um, and it's, it's always a great pleasure to be in the same room as uh, Jim Wilson, uh, from whom I've learned so much. Uh, but I am here as, the, as a designated critic, so, so let, me, let me get started. Um, I was grateful to Jim for, as, as usual, stating rather bluntly the central social factor, which is that bums are a pain in the ass. Um, there's a lot of euphemism that gets used, um, and I noticed uh, the head of McDonald gave, gave us the usual line about, well, it's not the people, it's the behavior. Oh, come on. Um, people who are drug addicted, mentally ill, jobless, and live on the street are not fun to have around. Europeans are sensible about this. They send them out to the suburbs where you don't hear about them until there's the riot. Um, Americans are stupid about it. We keep them in the inner cities, uh, which are expensive places to have them. Um, and as Jim also pointed out, concentration of bad behavior is a bad thing. Uh, better to disperse it. Um, well, that all seems right. Um, the central social process at work here, it seems to me, is one that's not as well as understood as it ought to be, but if anybody ever bothers to publish when do for sales, everybody will now understand it, which is positive feedback in law breaking and law enforcement. The police officer who looks out at a sea of people sleeping on the street, all of whom are breaking the law by sleeping on the street, and says, you know, arresting one of these people is just not going to do any good, um, is doing the right analysis, but only at one level. All of the people sleeping on the street are perfectly aware that the police officer will look out at the sea of them and decide that none of them is worth arresting. And now sleeping on the street is effectively lawful in that area. And it's a tipping problem, right? If you can get the level of enforcement high enough so that the probability of arrest for some violation gets to be big enough to discourage people, well, then they stop doing it and then you can stop arresting them. So if you can push yourself over that hump, you can get from a very disorderly place to a more orderly place with only a temporary spike in arrests. If you had to keep making the arrests for the rest of the eternity, it just couldn't be done. Uh, but the question is, can you concentrate and, and eventually get, the, get yourself down on the other side of the hump? And the answer is, as Jim pointed out, and as George has done in various places, um, is yes. Um, and that sort of dynamic concentration is something that we ought to pay more attention to in all of our law enforcement activities. Um, but deconcentration is a fine thing. I don't think we should be happy with the fact that we have no idea where those folks went. Um, some of them went to state prison. It's a pretty expensive homeless shelter. The last time I checked, um, lots of them presumably went to other parts of the city. Uh, whether they're doing more harm or less harm where they are than where they were, I don't think we know yet. Um, and so it's easy to take a picture of a street that's been cleaned up and say, oh, this is wonderful, uh, but you're not taking a picture of the street that's been messed up by the same, the same people. Still, it seems to be quite likely, A, that concentration is a bad thing, this word is better, and B, that if we're going to have concentration, it probably shouldn't be in the middle of downtown that we're trying to revitalize. I think we'd all, all be better off if we were frank about that rather than if we were using mystical part. The question, one question to raise is, what's the opportunity cost? Right? It's not as if we've got, I mean, thanks to Chief Bratton and the department, um, we've had a miraculous recovery from, from crime in the city, but we're still a pretty high violent crime city. Um, what, how many other lives could have been saved with those 50 officers for what, a year and a half? Something like that? And that's, that's a pretty big investment. Um, if you put it in South LA, um, how many blocks did you reclaim from the Crips and the Blood? I don't know the answer to that question, but it seems to me one worth, one worth asking. This is a pretty massive investment of police resources. And strikingly, it was an investment almost only of police resources. Um, it seems to me that the, the right critique of the Sacred Cities program, if you want to criticize it, is that it's a hammer and nail problem. All you've got is a hammer. 
everything looks like a nail. The police department, as usual, is the only agency that has to be there. Uh, and so they were said, told, go fix this problem, and they fixed the problem the way they knew how to fix the problem. But where the hell is everybody else? Both Jim and, and Hedda McDonald suggested that lots of the folks on Skid Row prefer to sleep out You know, I sort of doubt it. Um, it's sort of like the, the U.S. auto industry, you know, insisting that, you know, our cars are fine, there's something wrong with the customers. Uh, my guess is that lots of people prefer to sleep outdoors to being prayed over, uh, prefer to sleep outdoors to being bossed around. Um, but the question is, well, where's the low threshold shelter? Where's, this, where's the shelter you can go to at 11 o'clock at night, stone, and sleep indoors? Uh, I don't know how many of the people in Row would go into that shelter, um, but it seems to me it's a question worth asking. San Diego built a new SRO. That turned out that lots of those people actually had five dollars for a bed uh, if they could get it by the night rather than by the month. Um, so it seems to me that's that, that's something that's that's being underinvested. I think it's according to the report I read about Skid Row, a lot of the drug problem is heroin. Well, heroin's the one drug problem we actually can treat our way out of. I mean, it's not as if we have any very useful tr treatment for people who use crack or methamphetamine. There's no such thing as an empty slot in a methadone. Pill. You got methadone available, people take it, and when they take methadone, they take less heroin and they commit fewer crimes. Um, and if you can't cite the methadone clinic, so bring them in. But it seems to me that's a pretty straightforward thing to do, that as far as I can tell is not being done. Um, the LA City Jail is still dumping people on Skid Row when they get released. That seems like not very good work. Um, we still have a jail overcrowding problem, which means streets and services was a joke, right? It was, it was it was the notion was you know, either you're going to go to jail or you're going to take these services. Except there wasn't a place to put you in jail, so you got released after 24 hours. Not surprising, lots of people turned down that. Hey, we've got no threat left. If we want to fix the crime problem, we better get moving on our jail. As far as I can tell, nobody's even talking about expanding jail capacity in a place where you do 10 percent of your nominal jail sentence. And again, this is something that could be done in jail, since lots of these folks cycle through. We didn't talk much about the infectious disease problem, but if you look at those pictures and, you know, if you've got any, any public health background, you're saying to yourself, oh my God, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, tuberculosis. As far as I can tell, the LA County Jail doesn't even bother to test people, either on the way in or the way out. Um, so it does seem to me there's lots of stuff that could be done on top of Safer City um, that would both help maintain the, the cleanup of the area and provide some services to folks there. Um, but I don't think we should just congratulate ourselves because we made it impossible to live on the street in Skid Row until we figure out where people are going to live instead. Um, so I hope uh, that's uh, the, the full quota of, of criticism I was hired to provide. Um, and thanks to all of you. Very nice. The final speaker on this panel is Carol Wilkins. She is Director of Intergovernmental Policy with the Corporation for Supportive Housing, where she works to develop and support the implementation of policy solutions to end long-term homelessness for people who have complex health needs and multiple barriers to employment. I think she will give us a uh, reflection on just how complicated uh, this issue is, and it's our great pleasure to have with us today, Carol Wilkins. Carol. Thanks. I think I'm just going to speak. From here. <laughs> Thank you. Can folks hear me? I think my job today is to speak as, as a little bit of an outsider. I've spent time uh, visiting Skid Row over the last few years, and certainly spent a lot of time talking to folks who are working on the problems of Skid Row. Um, but my job is, is, is as Mark described, uh, what we've been talking about is a hammer and nail problem. I think part of my job is to talk about what some of the other tools might be and how other, other communities, other cities have worked to restore public order um, and address some of the problems we've heard described today using another set of tools um, and, and uh, I think that's helpful. I work for the Corporation for Supportive Housing. We're a national nonprofit organization. We help communities create permanent housing with services to prevent and end homelessness. Um, 
And what I want to do is talk a little bit. A couple of years ago, I was asked by the federal government, by HUD and HHS, who were sponsoring a research symposium on homelessness, to take a look at the last decade of research about particularly chronic street homelessness, long-term homelessness. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, with my colleagues reviewing pretty much everything that's been published in the last decade. Learned a lot from that research about who those people are who are living on the streets of our cities, how did they get to be um, living in places like Skid Row, who are the people who when they enter homelessness are most likely to get stuck and remain homeless for years on end, what does it cost um, when people are homeless, and uh, what are uh, some of the unintended consequences, perhaps, of this revolving door between our jails and our streets? Um, and finally, to touch on some of the better solutions to do all of that in seven minutes. Um, when we looked at the research nationally, and I think the characteristics from studies in Skid Row are really consistent with this data, certainly we're talking about a group that's predominantly men, racial and ethnic minorities, particularly African Americans, are uh, seriously overrepresented among this population. What's striking is that the average age of people living on the streets in long-term homelessness is now about 49, um, and it's getting about a year older every year, just like the rest of us. So it's a cohort of folks, um, largely, who are experiencing long-term homelessness or at risk of long-term homelessness. They're now very close to 50. Um, very high rates of unemployment and other things that we understand um, and would expect. But also, most of them don't have families to return to. In fact, a very large percentage of them experience foster care placement in childhood. Um, and when we look at the health conditions here, in addition to the alcohol and drug problems, which are very prevalent among people living on the streets, um, over half have serious uh, mental illness and very, very high rates of serious medical conditions, HIV AIDS, um, other life-threatening diseases, and other chronic health conditions. So that 50-year-old chronically homeless person living on the streets has a health status that looks more like your typical 80-year-old in this country. Um, locally, researchers have said that 80% or more of those people living on the streets of Skid Row are suffering from severe and chronic mental illness, addiction, serious health problems, or some combination of all of those. When researchers look at those people, lots of people in America today end up experiencing homelessness. Over half of the people living in the bottom fifth of the income distribution in this country spend more than half their income in rent. So when that happens, lots of people fall into homelessness briefly. The characteristics of people who get stuck in homelessness, who stay there for months and years on end, include a history of being in foster care as children experiencing very serious violence and victimization, both as children and then increasingly as adults, and certainly the um, what you heard earlier is, uh, I think, some, some insight into some of the violence that homeless people experience living on the streets. But for many, this violence and victimization began in childhood. Very high rates of substance abuse. Substance abuse increases the likelihood that someone will remain homeless. A history of involvement in the criminal justice system. So someone who's never been homeless before who gets dropped by the sheriff or the criminal justice you know, release system at the front door of the shelter system is more likely to be stuck there a year later than someone who doesn't have a history of involvement in incarceration. Older adults who enter the shelter system are at greater risk of remaining in the shelter system for a long time. When we looked at patterns of service utilization, so where are these folks going? Um, there are very high rates of use of shelters, hospital inpatient beds, emergency rooms, jails and prisons, and detox programs very low rates of engagement and retention in outpatient mental health services, substance abuse treatment, and primary care. So while many of us might wish that folks who are living on the streets would get into substance abuse treatment, stay in treatment programs, complete those programs, and then exit into housing, what we know is that for the vast majority of folks who are homeless and living on the streets, um, that route through substance abuse treatment into housing is not going to work for most of them. That's not the pathway that most people are going to take into housing and off the streets. Even programs that are designed for homeless uh, street alcoholics and homeless folks living in the streets with serious drug problems have very low rates of retention so that the majority of participants are either asked to leave or they walk away from the programs before they're happy. 
And this is all very extensive. Studies that looked at the cost of care for homeless people with mental illness or addiction found annual costs, and depending on the city, it might be $17,000, might be $42,000, but in, in urban areas where there's significant services available, the, the, the costs ended up usually in $30,000 to $40,000 a year range. Ambulance and hospital care for chronic public inebriates, the street alcoholics, just those two areas, ambulance and hospital care in, num in several cities, studies found that was about $8,000 a year for um, serving people in these settings. And Cal in California, the Corporation for Supportive Housing is heading up a program initiative in six counties, working with hospitals looking at the most frequent users of hospital emergency room care. Again, we found the most frequent users of hospital emergency rooms are homeless individuals with multiple serious health and behavioral conditions. And these folks are dying. What we find when those uh, same individuals get into supportive housing, the utilization of those expensive emergency and inpatient services in study after study, that service utilization is reduced by more than half. There's a revolving door between our jails and prisons and our streets, and certainly we heard a little bit about that earlier, but I think the scale and the magnitude of that is really important. Um, one of the things that I looked at in preparing for this is a, some material on the Manhattan Institute website. There was a forum that they held in 2006 looking at issues of recidivism and reentry and reintegration of men into the mainstream in our um, American cities. And um, I left out on the table um, some information there uh, related to um, some of that. But what we found um, in, in that information and in work CSH has been involved with on reentry, there are enormously high rates of incarceration in the last few years. And one of the speakers in the, in the Manhattan Institute session on this talked about the fact that we've had a 757% increase in incarceration among women over the last 30 years and a 257% increase in rates of incarceration among men during a period of time when crime rates have remained relatively flat. So our perception, our concerns about public order and public safety, our changes in public policy have incarcerated literally millions of Americans more than we were incarcerating in past years. And we now have a revolving door that brings those folks back to our streets and places like Skid Row. Rates of shelter use among uh, people leaving prison are higher than among people leaving psychiatric hospitals. In LA, 50% uh, of parolees were homeless in a study done about a decade ago. And in the handout there, I added another statistic. More than 20,000 homeless people cycle through in and out of LA's jails every year. Um, and so what we see is this cycle where individuals with very high rates of mental illness and substance abuse disorders are now increasingly incarcerated instead of being hospitalized. Um, incarceration and felony convictions can lead to a loss of housing. What we hear is that through, um, as perhaps one of the unintended consequences of safer cities, Dozens of supportive housing tenants who are beginning to put their lives back together and beginning to get off the streets and into housing um, have been arrested and federal housing subsidies can't get paid for empty apartments while people stay in jail too long, so they lose their housing. Um, if individuals end up with felony drug convictions, that can lead to long-term barriers to eligibility for housing assistance, um, as well as some of the other services and supports that would help people get back home. And at the Manhattan Institute Conference and the proceedings, one of the quotes I, I pulled from that that I think is really important, um, Commissioner Martin Horn from the New York City Department of Correction said, if we were serious about changing the cycle, we would ask the question of government, how much do you invest in seeing to it that upon release from prison or jail, every offender, every offender, goes someplace other than a home shelter? I want to mention quickly, every one of these homeless men and women living on our streets in places like Skid Row came from a family, um, and some of the research helps us understand the family backgrounds of these individuals. They certainly, as adults, have a lack of family connections and support, and in many cases, a history of family instability, victimization, foster care, and out-of-home placement. Many of these individuals experienced homelessness for their first time when they were children. And among the women that we see living on our streets and in shelters, most are mothers, the vast majority are mothers, but the longer they remain homeless, the more likely they are to be separated from their children. And again, particularly among the women on the streets, very high rates of foster care placement, victimization, uh, physical assault, and women. So in the last couple minutes, I'm just gonna hit on the 
some of the other tools. Supportive housing is a cost-effective combination of permanent, affordable housing with the services that help people live more stable and productive lives. There's a handout in the back, a lot more information about supportive housing available. I can't go into all of it here. But the key is that the housing is permanent, tenants uh, pay 30% of their income in rent for the most part, and they have access to a wide array of supportive services that help support first and foremost housing stability and provide the services and supports for recovery and resiliency. Um, more than 80% of those individuals in study after study, more than 80% of the individuals who are formerly chronically homeless remain in supportive housing for at least a year. Tenants engage in services even when it's not a mandate or a condition of housing. And housing is a critical factor, what we think of as a foundation for engaging in the services that support recovery. Um, utilization of emergency services declines, incarceration goes down. The, the bundle of strategies that works includes targeted outreach linked to available housing, not a shelter bed on a top bunk in a room with another 150 people, but a room of your own with a key in the door. Simplified eligibility process, sobriety is not a precondition for housing. Leases establish clear requirements and expectations for behavior. The subsidies make the housing affordable. The services uh, basically offer whatever it takes to keep people housed. And that housing stability then becomes the starting point on the road to recovery. The city of Portland has done this um, and found dramatic reductions in the numbers of unsheltered homeless individuals and street crime. Um, I left on the back table also a press release that just was, uh, just was released a week ago from the, the mayor's office in Seattle citing dramatic savings resulting from supportive housing programs utilizing this kind of an approach. What's striking in the Seattle press release is that in housing about 100 people, they were able to document savings of over $3 million in the first year. That means that savings of about $30,000 per person housed in those programs. I'd really love to see a similar press release from the mayor's office in Los Angeles um, citing the, the outcomes from housing chronically homeless people from Skid Row in support of housing in the future. I think first we'll let the panelists uh, interchange with one another. I think Professor Clayman had a, uh, had a comment. Some, something I, I left out and shouldn't have left out. It was mentioned that many of the people involved here are on parole. I assume that lots of those who aren't parole, on parole are on probation, but they are something or other. Um, and yet nobody even raised the question about where the parole agents and the probation officers are. Um, again, with without any capacity in the jail, it's hard to do what we know works, which is provide clear rules and immediate but mild sanctions for violating them. Um, so even if you have jail capacity, you need some other kind of capacity to make probation and parole legal. But it's, it's sort of weird to be talking about this population and nobody even raises the question of the criminal justice institutions that nominally uh, have been charged. Of course, the ACLU sued the LAPD for doing um, the so there has been time as well. Um, I would just uh, re-emphasize, though, I, I think um, that we've lost sight of the fact that really the Skid Row Initiative is about behavior, uh, not status. I mean, Mark may claim that it's really about the people themselves, but what had been allowed to develop on Skid Row was a culture of, of lawlessness. And as one of the senior lead officers, Dion Joseph, said to me, I don't care if there's 150 people hanging out on San Julian Street as long as they're obeying the law. Skid Row had a national reputation. People came from across the country because they knew that this was the place where you could live for free and do what you want. That there was, it was a law-free zone. And, and well, certainly, Carol's suggestions are absolutely valid. I think there's a sense of, of almost infantilizing this population, of talking about services that we can provide, which is, which is fine. Society has an obligation uh, towards its most vulnerable uh, and least fortunate members. But I think in, in, in sort of announcing, either implicitly or explicitly, as I think some of these advocates have done, 
you have no duty to obey the law, you are infantilizing them. And the, one of the most important steps you can take in, in moving towards the free is to say, we expect you to obey the laws like everybody else. Uh, and, and, and saying that you have a blank check, again, creates this sort of a destruction that, that uh, Commander Smith was talking about. People were killing each other and killing themselves because for too long the police have been uh, prevented from, from enforcing laws that everybody else takes for granted. And I, I think, you know, while certainly housing is a necessity, I think uh, expectations of, of law-abiding behavior are also necessary. You know, I think we all can find some common ground here. I think we all recognize that there are not enough beds and not enough housing for folks, uh, you know, in skin rate, certainly not enough for all the people in all of Los Angeles. And a lot of things that the professor was saying, you know, I quite frankly have to agree with. There's a, there's a lot more that we as a, as a society and as a city and as a county especially can do for this population that we have here. Um, we recognize that in every major city I've ever been in, there's always going to be homeless folks, whether it's here or in Europe or anywhere. And um, I think if you look at Main Street, which was the first street that we really started working, even before we started the Safer Cities project, uh, Sergeant McManus and the folks in the back had a uh, Main Street project, which was, we looked at Main Street, we said, look, this is out of control, we got to change the way this is. This is in 2005, late 2005, beginning of 2006. Um, Main Street project, we, uh, we recognized that, uh, we did a survey, three in the morning, there were 130 people wandering up and down Main Street. No businesses were open. These were folks that either lived and camped on the street there, across the street from Chrysalis, or, or across the street from Pete's Cafe, or just uh, were hanging out there because they're blood gang members who got a hotel room at the Huntington, and were out there selling their dope. They're up all night uh, selling dope back and forth. They sleep during the day on the sidewalks over there because we were prohibited from doing anything about it. Um, after we focused on Main Street with enough resources and police officers to change the kind of behaviors that Heather was talking about, um, things have completely changed on Main Street, and I cut out an article from this week's Downtown News in the back there that talks about one of the places to watch is Main Street between 4 and 7. Five years ago, if you would have said that's going to be one of the quickest growing places downtown, with the exception of Pete's Cafe, there was nothing there. It was a, it was a wasteland of um, people camping out and, and what. But you go down there, you still see homeless folks walking around. You still see once in a while someone who obviously has some type of, you know, mental issues or mental health issues or whatever, but they're coexisting with the lady that owns the Metropolis bookstore, with the lady that lives in the loft up above Pete's Cafe, with the folks that are uh, you know, running the Chinese or uh, Vietnamese food restaurant down there. It's, it's like, I think, the city's supposed to be located everywhere. Before we turn to the audience, I have a question that anyone should feel free to answer. And again, it's sort of the first principle. Does anyone have a right to live on the street? I mean, the country does have a history of vagrancy laws for a reason because we want these things to spiral out of control the way they have now spiraled out of control in which you're not addressing. The question is, does anyone have a right to live in the street? Or if you see 150 people, even if they're behaving themselves, is it still okay to be a big? Well, I, I think laws are, are, are crafted, certainly the LAPD sidewalk law is, is crafted a little more narrowly than that to maybe avoid Thinking on that specific issue, if you are blocking the sidewalk, if you are occupying public space in a way that interferes with other people's use of that public space, there is no right. Uh, again, cities are, are, are these extraordinarily vital, dynamic uh, places that the Manhattan and many other institutes, Milk Institute, uh, are, are trying to bring to their, their fullest potential. And if you let one group uh, sort of stake a claim to colonize the sidewalks, I, I think the consequences are have to spread far, far beyond. And, and the resources that are needed to provide the sort of help that, that Carol rightly invokes uh, will not be there if you kill cities by allowing public spaces to become places of absolute anarchy. Um, well, I'm probably the last guy you'd think is a civil libertarian, but actually I think I am. Um, I think 
that we as a society have a right to say, you know, no, you can't just go tent up and start camping on a piece of public sidewalk, as long as there's some kind of an alternative for the person to, to go to. And I, and, and I agree with, uh, you know, some of the things that have been said, you know, a pod in a room with a hundred other guys, maybe that's not enough of an alternative. But I think if we can provide a place where someone can have a key to a door and a little bit of privacy, then I think we have a right to say, you know, no, you can't sit on a tent and, you know, down the street from the police station. You can't take that up as your new home because that's a, si a sidewalk for all of us. But I think we have to have some kind of a reason to open up. Let's open it up to the audience. Your question. That's a great sentiment. We really appreciate that. I'd love to respond because I, as you began speaking, I thought she should have been on. Um, so I was glad that you said what you said. I think you're the real, one of the real experts in the room on this issue. I really appreciate what you said. And as you're saying it, it struck me that, you know, sometimes things, for good or bad, and my job, my role here isn't to defend some of the public behavior that, that I think disturbs everyone and, and victimizes many people. But sometimes things have to get so bad before anyone even looks to see what's going on in the lives of these folks. And, and I would really hope that in that same spirit of collaboration, really beginning to understand and listen to one another's perspectives, um, if the political will and the resources that have gone into this effort so far translate into the political will to do something better to address the needs that now more people are looking at. And we can come out the other end of this with something that we can all be proud of. Thank you. There's a microphone. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll have the other microphone go too. Hello. I'm the town crier. Um, you know, I'm just going to lay it out bluntly. I'm going to lay it out so that people can understand. And I'm going to ask the question because I have to ask the question. I've been living in transitional housing in Skid Row since 1999 and permanent housing in Skid Row since 1999. And let me tell you something. All the people can come in here and tell you that, you know, the people aren't being heard. But when, when, when he speaks, the people are being heard. Okay. There are people in my building, no offense to anyone, but there are people in those buildings down there that would stand in front of the building and wait for a woman.
to walk by because they could offer her a $5 hit of crack for sex. Okay? And that still goes on. So who's protecting those people? All right? Who's speaking for those people? He's speaking for those people. Okay? It's still happening. The other thing, I've seen the changes. I've had the opportunity when Estela Lopez from the, the, the bid was putting up those bright lights so that way those dope dealers would be scared from certain places and well at least have the light shined upon them and I would email her and say how come my light and how come there's not a light in front of my building across the street is a transitional house housing in her in the toy district where a friend of mine got brain damage a year she was clean okay and this is a transitional housing facility for the duly diagnosed somebody that suffers with mental illness and a substance abuse problem. And the dope man was sitting right there, feeding her crack one night as I walked by. Fear, because I'm not going to say anything. You don't want to approach these people when the crack man is right there, or was right there. And when I came back that evening from my choir rehearsal, her, see, her face was on the sidewalk, her lips in urine, while the crack man was laughing at her or laughing, having a good time. I walked in, got my friends, we brought her inside. Two days later, they found her in a room, foaming at the mouth, brain damage in the hospital. Who's speaking for these people? That man right there, okay? For too long, this neighborhood has gone with lawlessness, has been lawless. And we've allowed that to happen. People have allowed that to happen. Not because they didn't care, but because it wasn't convenient at the time because you could isolate the people. You didn't have to see it. But who's speaking for these people now? That man right there. But you, you can attack him all you want to. I live there. My question right now is, we don't have a bid in a certain part of downtown, in, in Skid Row. And right now, I'm afraid, because I hear my landlord asking, are we gonna get that money for our security guards and for our parks people that watch that area, that work? with the LAPD to make sure that that part of the area does, it continues to somehow get as good as the areas that the bid is in. These, this is what's going on. You have residents now living there, like me, people in Skid Row Housing Trust, people that can go to the bids and ask, or the LAPD, email a senior lead officer and say something's going on. Nobody's listening to me. Please listen to me. Please help me. Even the homeless people are doing that. These advocates, so-called advocates, don't speak for me. They don't speak for my neighbors, the ones that continue to suffer, because they want to prove a point, some sort of a point that, that, that they have the right to, to have this place continue to be lawless. This isn't about gentrification in Skid Row. There are 88,000 homeless people in the county and city of Los Angeles right now, yet everybody's focused on the over, a little over 500 that sleep on the streets at night in Skid Row. Why is that? Very well said. Why? Why is that? So my question to all of you in this room, please help us in that area. Please help my landlord, SRO Housing Corporation, when they go up and try to ask for the money for their security guards, because it's their security guards that also watch out for me. I guarantee you, if SRO Housing Corporation had those security guards there, I wouldn't want to live there. I guarantee you, I would be probably living on the street because it would probably be safer. But out on the street somewhere outside of downtown and outside of Skid Row. So let me tell you this right now. We need on-site supportive housing. That's what we need to push for. We need to push for it in all of our housing. SRO Housing Corporation, Skid Row Housing Trust, that's what was missing. But the most important thing, the conclusion that I came up with when I was attacking the harm reduction approach to substance abuse, because I did at one time. I've come to the conclusion, it doesn't matter if it's social model recovery, it doesn't matter if it's harm reduction recovery in that housing in Skid Row. Our problem is that the dope man was right in front of that housing selling the dope. How was any one of those, how was any one of those programs gonna work? So please, how are we gonna make sure that we get the money this year for our our, the people that take care of our parks and the part of Skid Row that doesn't have a bid. Let's have the commander maybe address parts of that. 
Thank you for that question. Thanks, Don. Hey, um, thank you again. Um, the problem we're having right now is the Skid Row Housing Trust maintains two parks, Gladys Park, Esther Housing Group, sorry, maintains two parks in downtown Los Angeles, the only two parks in downtown Los Angeles, one on uh, Fifth and Gladys and the other one down on six, Seventh and Crocker. And uh, they're great parks. One's right across from Carlos Nino's. They get a Friday afternoon. Think of the kids down there. The problem is their funding is coming due uh, in March, I think it is, Anita. And uh, the problem is we don't or we don't know where the money's going to come or if the money's going to come to maintain control of those parks and to maintain the security guards that are in those parks. And I tell you what, if there's no security guards in those parks, then we might as well just uh, put a big fence around them and not let anybody in. Because without the security guards that are there, um, those parks will become a, a the bids have been tremendous, and the, the bids, unfortunately, where the bids intersect, there's a couple of gaps in there. We were able to remove from one down by South Park so that the fashion district bid is now taking over. I think it was going to that, so that place is getting covered. We definitely need to have a uh, uh, bid covered in there because it's a world of difference in the place that has this. Time for a few more questions. This gentleman first, then you. Thank you. Just a, a It always, I guess I can find it as well as anybody. You know what, I can't say for sure, Tom, whether that's the case, but I can tell you this, when we do the maps, if you look at the area immediately surrounding the police station, uh, folks are allowed to sleep on the streets out there from 9 p.m. until 6 a.m. And if you come in before 6 o'clock, the concentration of folks on Fifth Street, just right around the police station, when, when they did the most recent map, is uh, it's incredible. There's a, a lot of people are still there. I think they want to live near the police station, maybe because they feel safer, Cops come and go in all the time, and they recognize that you know that's a safe thing to sleep. Um, the skid road that we knew when we first started this whole business has compressed. Main Street, I don't think anybody can say Main Street Park skid road anymore. In fact, two years ago it was, and it's it's getting smaller and smaller. The area that we think of when we think of skid road, you don't see people camping out too much on Los Angeles Street now. We think it's skid road, maybe even all the way over by Maple and Wall, maybe over towards Central. So it's compressing, but the density in that compressed area I think is good. Let me add an answer to this too, because one of the reasons you have such a high concentration of homeless people in, Los in Skid Row is because in the rest of Los Angeles city and county, it has been extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to cite programs that offer substance abuse treatment, that offer not only shelter, but that offer housing and support services for people who are homeless. So you are going to have a very high concentration of, of human distress in Skid Row until there is the political will and the neighborhood support to cite housing and services for, for people who need them in the communities that they are already living in and that they grew up in in many cases. Um, and I think that is going to take really communicating to your elected officials in particular the support for every, every part of this, this region taking on its fair share of responsibility for meeting the needs of the most vulnerable citizens in the region. If I can just add something to that though, um, you know, the, some of the people, I'm not going to name names, who have been attacking uh, the Safer City Initiative have raised this charge, not, not Carol, but of uh, NIMBYism and, and blaming communities for not wanting their fair share, well, that's very fine, but when these same critics are, are suing the LAPD uh, on a yearly basis for trying to maintain order around facilities uh, that are treating the mentally ill, that are treating addicts, it's quite understandable that uh, communities are going to say, no, thank you, if this is what having uh, social service providers in your neighborhood looks like, no thank you, I don't want it. So, you know, if we're going to make the argument for fair share distribution, we darn well better be sure 
uh, that we are giving the providers and the police the ability to maintain maintain public order on the streets. And and now, thanks to Commander Smith, uh, there's a stronger argument for doing so, but but the advocates cannot have it both ways. Mark Whitson. Um, my understanding is that both the jail and the prison system continue to release people on the street road, many of the two o'clock in the morning. Um, but due to the nature of the, of the uh, federal shelter subsidy laws, um, you're not eligible for shelter space the first night. You have to s sleep a night on the street before you're eligible for shelter space. Um, it seems to me there are, there are a bunch of policies that everybody, you know, every time you say, they say this, everybody says, oh yeah, that's, that's a stupid policy. And then we go right back to discussing um, how we need more arrests as this is the problem. Um, it seems to me that if somebody gets out of jail, you gotta have a place for them to sleep that night. And it probably shouldn't be in Skid Row. I mean, this is rock and science. Doesn't seem to get it. We have time for one more question. Hey, And I would just say that the people like that are, are best helped by public order. And um, it, it, as, as uh, Mr. Garza said, if you're, if you're either trying to recover financially or through addiction, you're not helped by having a, a, a anarchy of, of drug dealing on the street. So certainly um, people trying to go to find jobs and have a stable life With that, we're going to close this panel and take a short break. Maybe you could join me in thanking this panel for their fine contribution. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.